Welcome to everyone to Words and Pictures Equal Comics. My name is Gina Gagliano. I'm the publishing director of Random House Graphic, Random House Children's Books dedicated kids and YA graphic novel publisher, which exists because kids and YA graphic novels are amazing. And I'm here today with five wonderful authors and they're all going to introduce themselves and we're going to talk a little about kids and YA comics and what they are and how you make them in the creative process. Sophie, do you want to start off introducing yourself and telling us a little about your graphic novel? Sure. Hi, everyone. Hi, Gina. I'm super excited to be here. So my name is Sophie Scabas. I'm a cartoonist and an illustrator. Uh, I am also a mother. I have three kids. Um, I'm French, as you can certainly hear. And I just recently, like a week ago, moved to Montreal after 12 happy years in Brooklyn. And the book that I'm promoting is called The Witches of Brooklyn. Voila. Okay. Um, Tyler, how about you? Sure. Um, I'm Tyler Fetter, and I am an illustrator and comics artist from Chicago. And my book is Dancing at the Pity Party, a dead mom graphic memoir. <laughs> Um, okay, Victoria, how about you? Hi, uh, so I'm Victoria Jameson. I also create graphic novels. I mean, it's a graphic novel panel. Um, my first graphic novel was Roller Girl. Um, after that, I made All's Fair in Middle School. And then my book that just came out in April with my co-author, Omar Mohammed, is When Stars Are Scattered. So Omar couldn't join us today, um, but he says hello. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, that's me. Awesome. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, Chad, what about you? Hi, um, I'm Chad. I'm a cartoonist in Chicago. Um, my first book was The Cardboard Kingdom, which I wrote with 10 writers. And uh, then my most recent book that came out this summer is Doodleville. Thanks, Chad. Vicki, how about you? Hi guys, uh, my name is Victoria Ying, but we're gonna call me Vicky on this call. Uh, my background is in animation and I am a author and cartoonist. Uh, my book, City of Secrets, came out uh, from Penguin Random House just last week. Yay! Okay, so such a, such a fantastic group of authors and a number, so many amazing books on this panel. Um, so here's a question for all of you. Making graphic novels requires you to make great writing and great art at the same time. How did you work on your writing and art so that you were ready to make graphic novels? Like, where did you start out when you were a kid and how did you get from there to uh, where you are today? Vicki, let's start with you. Um, yeah, so the story of City of Secrets is that I actually wrote this as a pro challenges of drawing and as a graphic novel because it's like a giant moving city and with my experience in animation I knew I was like that is a lot of work and I would prefer not to. <laughs> um, but I also realized that my own limitations as a prose novelist was really that like as a visual artist I'm really bad at description. Like I can see everything so clearly in my head that changing that picture in my head into words was really difficult. So I actually found that um, adapting my novel for a graphic novel made a lot of sense, both in terms of my strengths and my weaknesses. Chad, I saw you nodding your head throughout that. What about you? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I've felt the exact same insecurity if I were to ever try to write a prose novel that I'm just not good at <laughs> describing things with the words because I imagine it in my head. Um, I, I love visual storytelling. I think uh, striking imagery is what's always captured my imagination and, and drawn me to various pop cultural things. And um, so I, comics has always been a natural outlet for me. Uh, I would guess that most of us on the panel either with writing or with art have one of the two that we kind of 
are most nat naturally um, drawn to. And then we've kind of struggled with the other to bring that up to the same like, bar of quality. And for me, I have always loved drawing and it was a long process of kind of teaching myself how to write and taking writing classes to kind of figure out how to tell a story well. And um, so I think finally I'm there. <laughs> Victoria, what about you? Uh, yeah, I think I'd agree with Chad that for me, drawing was definitely the easiest part, even as a kid. Um, I just loved to draw. So I just, I practiced it, even though I didn't know I was practicing, I just did it all the time. And as for the writing, which I do struggle with, um, I think it helps that I, even as a kid, I love to read and I read all the time now. So I think by reading great books and reading books over and over and over again, I kind of taught myself the craft of writing without knowing it. So when I was little, I loved Ramona, like the Ramona Quimby books. And my librarian was like, stop checking those out of the library. Like, you've read them too many times. But I think reading them so many times just ingrained in my brain, just some tips of writing that I didn't even know I was learning. How about you, Tyler? Um, same as the previous two, drawing is the thing that comes most easily to me. It was like my favorite thing to do as a kid and I was always doodling in my notebooks and class, um, but I didn't really know that it could be a career. It felt like an imaginary career, like a princess or something. Um, so when I was in college, I majored in screenwriting and really loved it. And I feel like screenwriting has a lot in common with comics because it's a lot of dialogue, um, sort of like the speech bubbles, but you're just typing it all out. So um, I feel really lucky that once I graduated, I learned that these two things could come together <laughs> and now I get to do both of them. What about you, Sophie? Yeah, uh, I guess I, I, can, I can find myself in everything that uh, everyone said. It, for me as well, it, drawing comes first. I've always been drawing and uh, I get a little bit like in Asterix and Obelix, you know, I kind of fell in the magic potion when I was a kid. I mean, my dad used to be a collector of graphic novels. So I grew up reading graphic novel and really eating all that, like as much as I could. and. Uh, and in my illustration, I mean, incorporating like, you know, speech bubbles, having the text coming with the illustration, it came very naturally, you know, sequencing an action into a panel, all that. I, I didn't had to work at that. It came like, it came naturally. Uh, what took much, much longer is to find the, the confidence to try myself on a long form, like on a real story, um, because I've, been like making like, uh, you know, like short comics and pages of comic forever. When I was, when I first moved to New York, I used to have a diary in like uh, comics form. But a long story, that's something else. And it really took me meeting uh, my agent. She's the one who gave me like the, the push and uh, the confidence that I needed to, to try myself at it. And uh, thank you, Kelly. You're amazing. So, yeah. Okay, so now I'm curious about what comics you read as a kid that really inspired you and, you know, maybe made you start thinking about doing graphic novels, the, the princess of all careers. Um, Tyler, you want to start? Sure. I don't know if this exactly counts as graphic novels, but the books that I was really into as a kid were um, the Amelia's Notebook series by Maritza Moss. And there are these like books that are like a journal of a girl named Amelia. The cover looks like um, like that black and white um, pattern that you've seen on notebooks before. And so it's a lot of like writing from her perspective and she draws little pictures in, in the margins and puts arrows pointing to them and telling what they are. And, um, those like made a big impact on me I think like without even realizing it because I've had people now tell me that my art reminds me a little bit of that because I have arrows pointing to stuff too um 
but yeah, I have a big stack of them on my bookshelf behind me. Hey, that's great. Victoria, what about you? Well, um, I was a, as a kid, I was a card memory, card carrying member of the Snoopy fan club. Oh. I didn't have this class yeah. in here on purpose. I kind of noticed before I, before we started recording. So I love Snoopy. I didn't read a ton of graphic novels. I read the comics in the newspaper. So I love the Peanuts, Calvin and Hobbes. I think everyone loved. And um, for better or for worse. And I think I liked Calvin and Hobbes and for better or for worse, especially because they're about real families and real kids. And I just, I know I love seeing the kids and for better or for worse grow up. We were all, I have two brothers. We were all like the same age as those characters. So like even in college, I'd call my mom and be like, did you see like who Elizabeth's dating? It's just a big part of my childhood. That's awesome. Chad, what about you? I was just laughing to myself when Victoria was discussing her favorites because I um, just am not satisfied with everyday life. I need <laughs> magic and superpowers and costumes. So as you can guess, I was uh, completely obsessed with superhero comics, X-Men, Marvel, DC, everything. Um, I just, I love, I find that um, when I think about everything I loved as a kid, it was anything that incorporated something like a, a, a layer of magic or something exceptional over the mundane reality of everyday life. Um, and I, I still find that to be true. I mean, I was just emailing with you, Gina, about the sci-fi space operas that we love. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I love everyday life in reality, but in fiction, I just love the fantastical. Vicki, what about you? Um, so, you know, I'm a millennial, so my experience growing up was waking up at six o'clock in the morning to watch Sailor Moon, and then realizing that, oh my god, there's other ways I can consume Sailor Moon. There's comics, yeah. too. So then, you know, I went to the comic book store for the first time and picked up Sailor Moon, and then I found this whole shelf of manga, like, more content that was similar. Um, so like my very first comic that I absolutely fell in love with was Ranma One Half by Rumiko Takahashi. And I just, you know, I, I was much too young for it. I realize this now. I was like in the seventh grade when I started reading that book, but like the humor in it, the action, um, and that's always kind of been the types of comics I've loved. I've loved like shonen manga written by women for some reason. That's like always my bag. It's like, oh, is it a boys comic written by a woman? Yes, 100% <laughs> I'm here. And um, yeah, so like Ron Mo One Half, Full Metal Alchemist, um, like books that have these big adventurous stories, but also these like kids or teens who are like dealing with teen and kid feelings, like, um, you know, the fantasy of having powers like Sailor Moon was always like really appealing to me. And, um, you know, my family's from Taiwan, so I would go to Taiwan and I would get the comics that were like early, you know, like before they were translated into English and I would attempt to read them um, with my very broken Chinese. But uh, it was like a real interesting way for me to connect to both like my family in Taiwan and also like to um, engage in comics. Yeah. Thanks. Sophie, what about you? What are some of your inspirations? I guess all the all the French and Belgium classics were like the, the book that I was reading when I was a kid, you know, like all the, um, some of my favorites are Joanne Pierluit by, um, uh, by Peyo, definitely. I love the humor. I mean, the characters are incredible. Uh, he's the, the creator of the Smurfs. That, and the Smurfs appear for the first time in one of the adventures of uh, Joanne Pierluit. Uh, André Franquin is like probably my master if I have to name one. Jo uh, all the Spirou et Fantasio adventures, the Marsupilami, Gaston Lagaffe, of course, Gaston Lagaffe, I mean, he's like the, the ultimate uh, anarchist for kids, you know, it's like, <laughs> he's incredible. Um, I, I really, I'm very impressed by the way André Franquin is like representing like you know, his, the body attitude, the faces expression, the fury, the, the, the surprise, everything that really stayed with me, I think, and uh, my love for like very expressive characters. Um, Yakari, I guess, by Derib as well, which is the story of this little Native American who can talk to the animals, 
that's one of my fantasy. Um, and yeah, and manga as well, because when I was a kid growing up on the French TV, there was this, uh, this show called The Club Dorothée, and she was showing kids like all these mangas, I mean, like all this anime. And I was, that's where I discovered Sailor Moon, like um, City Hunter. I was watching that, I was way too young. Um, like, I mean, I, I can't think about everything now, but I mean, so, so many uh, animes like that. And the Ghibli Studio, like definitely a big influence on me, the Ghibli Studio. Thanks. So I'm curious about all of your process. Um, can you can you talk about where you make your graphic novels? Like, what is your workspace like? And if you if you have um, any of your workspace around, can you can you show us what it looks like with your camera? Um, Vicky, do you want to go first? Oh sure, yeah. Um, oops, sorry, I had to unplug my monitor real quick. Um, but this is my desktop space. I do most of my comics on my iPad, actually. Um, I use the apps Comic Draw and Procreate. And this is like my little auxiliary desk for doing, um, you know, like drawing with real media, <laughs> anything that's not digital. Uh, I'm also like currently really obsessed with my planner. So <laughs> that's what's sitting there right now. Um, but yeah, otherwise, like my room is a little messy. I'm still like packed up for all of the cons that aren't happening anymore. <laughs> so uh, that's what most of the, the space I'm not showing you is full of right now. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Chad, what about you? Um, I'm currently in my bedroom. I cannot show you my workspace, but it's not very exciting, honestly. Um, I just work digitally, so I just have a two monitor set up and draw on my monitor. And um, most of the other stuff in my workspace was like a big old legal file cabinet to hold all, all my old prints that I threw out recently. Um, so yeah, it, my, my workspace is all digital and boring. I, I hear you have a situation where your cat can come and help you. Um, yeah, my cat does like to make appearances. Um, yeah, but I, I have two cats and they both come and paw at me when they need attention. I've locked the door though, so they can't come in right now. Aw. <laughs> uh, ne next panel, maybe. Victoria, what about you? Yeah, I'm in my studio now. And I have to say, when I saw this question on the list, I was so excited because I love like peeking into people's houses. So, okay. so yeah, I'm in my studio. Um, it's an octagon, that's what I like to call it the octagon. It's on the third floor. Let me see if I can, of a, of my house so it's beautiful that's my favorite part the door because i can just shut it and my family yes. alone. i can relate to that <laughs> and i like it because i i my it faces the front street so i can peer at my neighbors and like eavesdrop on what they're talking about um and then i had to have one desk so i do most of my stuff um traditionally and when it comes comes time to do digital i just move the other paints and stuff and then, I don't know if you saw my bookshelf, that's another big part of my studio because I'm always reading other graphic novels. And yeah, I, I love being up here. I'm so glad I have a studio to myself. Um, it's glorious. Your, your octagon room is very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, what about you? Uh, well, I live in a one bedroom apartment and Chicago so I like to dream about having a room that's just my studio but where I'm sitting right now is just like a wall in the living room that has my desk on it um, over here is my little setup because I have an Etsy shop where I sell prints so I have all my printing stuff here um, but I do my art for books and mostly everything on my iPad I also use procreate and uh, as, as much as I probably should sit at a desk, I honestly do most work on the couch. <laughs> I have a lot of throw pillows and I'll sit on the corner and put a pillow on my lap like a desk and I put my iPad there and I watch a movie or listen to a podcast or something. And my cat bothers me all the time. He's in that Trader Joe's bag. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh -huh. favorite place to be. I cleaned my apartment for this, but he still wanted me to leave the Trader Joe's bag out. So he might come mm -hmm. out at some point during the piano. Wow, wow. He's been very quiet. <laughs> I know. He goes in there for hours at a time. <laughs> he's a little weird. <laughs> That's awesome. Sophie, what about you? As I said, I, I just like uh, moved to this new place a week ago. I mean, look really nice because the place is furnished and the people had some graphic novels so I have like a nice background but I haven't set up an office yet or a space to work. I carry with me this little case that is like it's, been, it's my little kind of office. I love that thing. It's like there's a lot of me in that little case you can see. So that's my little portative office but um, Otherwise, I like to surround myself with books, a lot of graphic novel. I put a lot, lot of pictures on the wall, like drawings from, um, from illustrator I, I, I admire, I love. Uh, maps, I love maps too. Uh, and then a lot of objects. I had like some little rocks, some like a, a tube of sand from my hometown in France, um, some fur toy. Uh, it's a bit messy. I, I'm kind of... Um, I like I like to have a, my my little mess around and the cat the spot for the cat too. That's that's it. Um, so beyond materials, there's so many parts of a story. There's characters, there's a plot, there's a setting, there's a conflict, and all sorts of other things that come into it. When you're thinking about what should I make a book about? Or is there one of those things that comes first for you? And like, how, how does that, how does your story come together? Um, Tyler, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, the book that I did is a memoir, so I didn't really have to think of characters <laughs> or a plot. Um, but since it was um, like a sensitive topic, it's about my mom's illness and death when I was in college so it was like a real emotional journey and I talked about it in therapy a lot and did a lot of crying and looking through old photos um so it was sort of like a personal like adventure um but in I think in the future when potentially I'll make art that's not always about my life um I think like images are probably what come to me first, like sort of a general sense of a look of something. And I kind of like brainstorm and build it from there. What about you, Victoria? Well, my first two books were a lot different than my most recent book. So like Roller Girl, for example, was based a lot of my own experiences because I played roller derby and based on you know experiences I had as a kid, like what it was like to lose my best friend. Um, for this book, When Stars Are Scattered, it was a lot different because it wasn't based on my life. It was completely based on Omar's life. So in this case, it's like I was hearing the story and the characters at the same time. So as I was getting to know Omar and we were working together, I would hear more about his life and learn more about him as a person and his brother. So this is a really interesting experience. Um, and it was, it was nice where I didn't have to really make anything up is if I ever had questions about what should happen next, I would just call Omar and he would tell me what happened next. So um, I think I learned a lot in writing this book, a lot about like listening to other people instead of always trying to tell a story. So my next book isn't a collaboration, it's my own creation again. So I'm gonna try and use what I learned from this book about listening to other people and put that into the whatever I do next. Chad, what about you? Um, so definitely, like, I'm someone who whose ca characters sort of live in my head for a while before I understand what their story will be. But what kind of sustains me throughout the super long, um, arduous task of actually making a graphic novel is kind of figuring out what central core or question is at the center of the book that keeps me interested. Like what am I interested in exploring or showing um, in the book? And with Doodleville, 
it's very much centered in the creative process of the act of collaborating, of creating a character, and then of being uh, haunted by that character and, and uh, like uh, racked with anxiety and, and insecurity and, and how that can corrupt everything you love. And um, so that was kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, for even when I'm collaborating with each story, like in the Cardboard Kingdom, um, there was kind of an emotional core or question at the heart of each story that helped inform all the different decisions you have to make. Because making a book is so hard, there are so many choices to make along the way. Um, but by keeping like the thematic heart at the center of it all the time, um, it really helps me make all those decisions to make sure that like what I want the book to be about is what it turns out to be about. Victoria, what about you? Um, so for me, I read widely and I love all kinds of different genres of books. So um, my first series, which is this, you know, the steampunk middle grade, um, this one came to me because I actually don't dream as myself all the time. Like I'd say 50% of this time I dream of other people, like their characters basically, I'm like watching a movie. So I had this dream about two kids running away from a group of assassins in a moving building. And that was just like the one scene that was in my mind that I was able to hold on to. And then from there, I was like, how do I build backwards from this? Who are these kids? Who are these assassins? Why does this building move? like what is the whole world around it and like I'm obsessed with story structure so having all that those like fun pieces of like here's these like big um you know almost like cinematic moments and then how do I build a story around that was really how City of Secrets came about um my next book series is or not series my next book is memoir based so it's a YA contemporary book about growing up Asian American and having an eating disorder and that book is incredibly different because it's very much based on my own experiences. Um, but when I tried to write it as a straight memoir, I just got too caught up in structure, like story structure. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up making it fiction because it kind of was able to fit the thing I was trying to, to say a little bit better than just traditional memoir. Um, so yeah, like in terms of just how I write and how I choose my stories, a lot of it's, it's all over the place. Every single book is different. And um, yeah, I have a lot of fun with that too. Oh, also Tyler, by the way, I had to go through a lot of therapy and I found out you can write that off in uh, oh. on your taxes. Cause if you wrote a book about it, that totally counts. Oh, that, I should have known that a few months ago. <laughs> That's great. I think, I think you can argue with your CPA to, to like make them retroactively put that into your write-off for your business expenses. Great. Sophie, what about you? Um, I, I guess for me, I mean, for the Witches of Brooklyn, the characters came first. I mean, I, I saw them uh, before hearing them, definitely. And uh, it all started with a little sketch, in fact, a little sketch of, of Silly Man and, and Lion together. And, um, and I really, I mean, the character stayed with me. It was like, you know, this imaginary friend in your head and they, they, they stay with you. And, uh, and that's when you know, I guess, that you have a story in your hand. It's like, I didn't have the old story, but it, it's like if someone had placed me on the starting square of the board game, you know, it's just like, yep. You don't know where you're going, but you're on track, lady. And that's, that's, how, I, that's how I felt. And, um, and a little bit like what you described, you described, Vicky, like when you have like, I had scenes in my head, but couldn't really attach them all together. But I, I kind of built from those scenes with this character and uh, letting them talk to me. Um, so when when you're starting your story what comes first the writing or the art do you start out with like drawing your character drawing your scene or do you start out with like here's my outline or you know i'm gonna just start out with the text and then the art's gonna come later um vicky do you want to start sure 
Um, I mean, I, I mentioned before that City of Secrets was a prose novel, so I started with the words for sure. Um, and I kind of need to see the whole story. I need to see like where my characters go in order for me to be able to, to accurately put um, like the visuals together from that. So yeah, like I always actually script out my entire um, graphic novel before I put a single drawing in just because for me, like I, my background in animation, I read a lot of screenplays. So screenplays and storytelling to me come first and then afterwards I, I kind of make the art to fit the story. Chad, what about you? Um, it, it really helps me bring a character to life and understand a character to draw them. Um, I kind of like discover new aspects of their personality um, through how they look and how they act and how I find myself drawing them. Um, that's a theme in Doodleville where drawings literally come to life and surprise you sometimes. Um, and then I, I do love a very good outline, um, but once I have an outline, I like to do a rough draft, um, a, a drawn illustrated rough draft, because for me, the actual, the actual act of like drawing the space and the settings and the scenes really, really helps bring it to life for me. And, and I, I discover so much in visually thinking through a story that I couldn't if I were just trying to script it. Victoria, what about you? Um, well, yeah, a lot of what Chad was just saying was resonating with me because I'm in the middle of doing the sketches for a book now. And yeah, sometimes drawing the characters um, houses and just drawing the characters. But um, for this book, I did like floor plans of the characters rooms and just drawings of what their house looks like. And just that sort of thing is so integral to me to realize, oh, they live here. Her room is back here. It just helps it all like make sense, even if it's not in the book. And I think usually when I start a book, I start with the drawing because that's sort of how I let my imagination go and how I get to know the character just by drawing them looking angry or looking happy. And it's just a way to start developing storylines just by seeing how they react to things. So yeah, I think the drawing definitely comes first for me. And then at some point I write a whole script before I draw the whole book because that's a lot of drawing to do. And I think through the whole process, that's a lot of back and forth because I'm at a point now where one part of the story doesn't work visually. So I need to go back and change the words because the visual is not working. So for me, it's a lot of back and forth, but definitely starts with the drawing. Oh, Tyler, how about you? Um, so this was my first time making a graphic memoir and I, what I thought I was gonna do was like, type up the whole story um, first and then go back and draw it. That was like our plan for the manuscript. And I started doing that and just felt like everything I wrote sounded bad. Like it just felt like I kept falling into like cliches of how I was writing things. So what I ended up doing was I split the story into chapters, which were based on like, um, individual events during the process of um, the story. So it was like a chapter about the funeral. And then for each chapter, I would go to my Google Doc and just like dump everything out that I remembered from that time in like a vaguely coherent way. And then I would take my sketchbook, like a paper, um, real life sketchbook, and I would use the little a uh, blurb that I put on Google Docs and kind of like turn that into um, a sketched out chapter. And uh, so there was a lot of that like back and forth between the art and the text, but that worked a lot better for me to like kind of do it all at once instead of turning in a manuscript and sketches separately. What about you, Sophie? I think for me, me too, I mean, I, I, what you said, Victoria, is like really resonate with me. It's, uh, it's the art come from, come first, definitely. But I, I, I do, 
it goes back and forth, but uh, I, I need to be doodling the characters. I need to see them. So even in the middle of the writing process, I will, I will draw the house, I will draw the rooms, I will draw the, their outfits, like the, the expressions and uh, even lip little little scene that won't appear at all in the book like you know them at a cafe or them like you know trying shoes on or uh, that really helped me to 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 figure out who they are and where we are going all together in that story so yeah drawing drawing comes first so speak, speaking of all this drawing each of you have your own personal art style which is something that i love about graphic novels like every every prose book basically looks the same inside like you open it up and it's full of text but you open up graphic novels and you can just tell that they're by different people just by looking at the art and seeing people's individual style so how did you get to your own personal style like how how did that develop uh, Tyler, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think when I started trying to do art as a job, I like really wanted to figure out my style like as soon as I could and make it really consistent. And um, and it just wasn't happening. Like the the art that I was making wasn't looking the way that I really wanted it to. And I think what ended up happening was that just in making a lot of art, it slowly turned into a style. I think it's, it's kind of like when you're a kid and you learn how to write, um, like actually write letters that at first, they all are just kind of like blocky and then eventually you have handwriting and everyone's handwriting is different from each other. That's um, exactly how I think of it too, by the way. Yeah, like I don't think you, I mean, I would like, I would definitely see other people's art styles and be like, oh, they make the noses kind of rosy, like the cheeks, and I like that. So I would add that into my style. But on the whole, I think it was just something that like developed <laughs> magically, naturally on its own. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel the same way. Victoria, do you want to talk about your more about your art handwriting? Yeah, well, I'm just excited, Tyler, because I've never heard anyone else use that analogy, but I've used it when I visit schools before, because I think, or like when I visit high schoolers and everyone's, yeah, you're really concerned about getting a style and what's my style? But I think, um, yeah, it just kind of eventually comes out, like when you've got a story you want to tell and you need to draw it, it's going to come out. Um, I think I definitely worked on developing a style I did picture books before I did a graphic novel and I was always drawing animals and then when I wanted to write roller girl I was like I don't know how to draw people so I, would, I copied a lot of art um oh my god I love that <laughs> I, this is my copy from when I was a kid it's kind of nice having zoom because I could just like grab these so my brother and I shared this book this is ours when we were kids and so I love Yo Fujikawa and just the way she draws people. They're so, they're just so cute. And like, they look like real kids, but they're cute. And I poured over this book as a kid. So when I had to write a book with people, I was like, I, how do I draw people? I would just copy her work and see how she put them together. So I don't think my characters look exactly like hers, but I think drawing them and understanding how she put people together helped me develop my own style. So that's something I recommend to kids or teenagers who are developing a style, like copy art, see what you like, see how they do it, um, and then eventually your own style will come out. Chad, what about you? Um, I often have struggled like adding too much detail or trying to make things look too realistic. And then later I'll look at that art or that comic page and be like, all that extra detail I added doesn't actually add to the story and actually can clutter it and take away from it. Um, so for my first books, a big part of the process was like simplifying and figuring out how to not let myself do all of that. So with Cardboard Kingdom, I use kind of like a very chunky, clean line style. And like the entire book was drawn, like all the line art was drawn with one drawing tool in Clip Studio Paint that like didn't let me do detail. 
you know, I, like it was my way of limiting myself to really distill each character down to their essence and draw them with as few lines as possible. Um, and so that, that again, I, I think we all see the world differently. And, and when we try to simplify the world in a cartoon, we all do it different ways. And so I'm really drawn to like dot eyes and simplicity um, and expressivity and big, bright color. Nikki, what about you? Um, so my background in illustration was definitely about having more styles than just one. And that actually is part of my own personality too. Like I have ADHD and I get bored really easily. So, you know, one of my strengths when working in the studio was that they knew that they could put me on any show and I would, I, it would be fine. Like they're like, you can do anything. Uh, which is actually a problem for books because I think that they want you to have a much more like defined style. Um, but that is definitely a thing that a lot of students ask, like, how do you find your style? And I always have to tell them, like, you don't find your style, your style is going to find you. It's about you and your absorption of all the stuff that you like, and you just like, like a cocktail shaker, mix it up and pour it out. And it's a new thing and it's you. Um, so I think that like for students who are trying to learn and develop their own styles, like consume, you know, take all the stuff that you like and just naturally it's going to come out of you because that's just how we are. Um, for City of Secrets specifically, like I definitely developed a specific style for this book. Part of it was for the story, like I, I developed this art specifically to tell this exact story. And my process for coming up with it was um, minimum viable product. <laughs> what is the least I can do in order to communicate exactly what I wanted? So, you know, the entire book, like I, I did this in another talk where I'm like, I cheated basically the entire time. Um, I used a very like dirty looking brush specifically so I didn't have to be clean. <laughs> so then if there are mistakes in it, it looks intentional. <laughs> and the coloring, like I developed a coloring style that was to mimic full color without being full color. <laughs> and people are like, wow, it looks so unique. And I'm like, yeah, it's because it's one giant cheat. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> now you know my secret. <laughs> cheat, what kid. Yeah. What about you, Sophie? Tell us your secrets. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I agree with everything that people say. It's not something that you that magically appear. I mean, it's, it, yeah, it does magically appear. In fact, it's by like, you know, it's by living, by experiencing things, by like reading as much as you can, by falling in love with books, with art, with people that, you know, it will, it will make you who you are. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, the metaphor of the musician is like really, you know, who you're going to jam with, what kind of music you're going to fell for, and that's going to make you who you are and, and what kind of music you bring to the world. I think it's exactly the same with illustration. And for me, Belgium and, and French uh, uh, comics had a huge influence, clearly. I mean, when I, when I see like the way I like to have very expressive characters and do more, I mean, I'm, I'm, I fall for character that make you smile. I mean, that's what I love really. And uh, that's, that's my thing. And I, and I hope people will like my characters and have fun with them because that's, that's what I want. Cool. So we've been talking a whole lot about graphic novels on this panel because that's what the panel is about. Um, but I'm curious about things that you do when you're not making graphic novels and whether those things play into your creative process and your inspiration. Uh, Vicki, do you want to start and talk about that? Sure. Um, you know, obviously graphic novels, art and illustration are a big part of my life. And it's difficult to kind of find a hobby because your job is also kind of your hobby. <laughs> um, but, you know, something I do like to do is actually revisit prose. Like, I still want to write prose. I still know that I have weaknesses in that area, but practicing writing prose has been really rewarding and actually really helps my graphic novels too, because I can kind of, you know, practice story and do these short little things that are very personal and very weird. Like, again, I, I like to read a lot. And so I have all these different stories, like horror stories or historical fiction or science fiction. And I just love to be able to um, get stories out quick, which is the benefit to prose. 
Chad, what about you? Um, I don't have a ton of interesting hobbies. I love cooking and making up recipes and um, I love video games and I've been thinking a lot about them lately. I think um, obviously there are a lot of kinds of video games, but I love video games that present interesting choices to you, the player. Um, sometimes it's like good and evil, but some, a lot of times they're much more interesting and like really make you think. And then it often has an impact on the rest of the game. And I think as a writer, it's really interesting to come up, to think about interesting choices to give your character hard. Interesting for a reader to see them make that decision. Or I, I love ensemble stories and I love having different characters come up with different solutions to that problem or to that difficult decision. Um, and also just love unwinding at the end of the day. Cool. Uh, Victoria, what about you? Kind of a hard one to answer because I mean, some of my past books were based on my hobbies that I had, like playing roller derby. That's probably the most obvious one. Um, because it's a big part of my life and I loved it so much. I wanted to write a book about it. But now I don't really have any hobbies. I think, um, especially the past few months, like I'm just trying to keep myself sane. So things like I like to, I go running and that kind of like makes me calm down, which you know, like reduces anxiety and just lets me think. <laughs> so I think that's kind of what I'm focused on now, just like not freaking out all the time. So that's what my hobbies are now, just, you know, not freaking out. And I think that does play into books somehow because that's the only way I can really write if I'm not worried about the world and what's going on. I just need to like be in my own headspace. I need to like clear the space for that to happen. Yeah. Oh, that's important. Tyler, what about you? Um, well, my big hobby currently is that um, we recently had to clear out my grandparents' garage and they were a little on the pack rat side and they had tons and tons of old family photos um and i get a lot of comfort out of sorting things i like i'm the person where if i eat m ms or skittles or something i like sorting them by color it just like calms me down so um uh, so i'm the one in my big family that has been chosen to go through all these tons and tons of family photos. So I have like on my coffee table back there, there are all these stacks of photos and I've been sorting them by who's in them and when they were taken and where they were taken. And um, a lot of my art is autobiographical. So I think it, it gives me like insight into my past and my family's past sort of feels like um, going in a time machine. And, uh, and I also really love cooking. And sometimes I think about how like cooking is like a creative hobby of mine that there is no pressure to be good at it at all. I live alone. I'm like pretty easily pleased with food. Like the, um, the ingredients I get are all things I like anyway. So it's nice to like take a break from making creative work that other people are going to see and judge and to just be like, oh, I'm going to try this recipe. And if I mess up, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm not on MasterChef. <laughs> like, it's just for me. It's fun. No, that's great. Sophie, what about you? Um, when I'm not drawing or making comics, I mean, it's not a hobby, but I, it's my kids. I mean, I have three kids and I do need and, and want to spend time with them. So I, 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 that's what I do when I'm not, I'm not drawing. And, uh, and it's amazing to spend time. I mean, it's extremely tiring, three kids, but it's, it's also, I mean, you know, we, we are own team, you know, like three kids, two parents, we're five, everywhere we go, we, we, we are own team. We have like our secret codes and our secret jokes and stuff. And it, it's pretty cool to be in, in a team with kids. I mean, even if I don't have the best role, I'm, I'm the mom, that's definitely not the most fun part of the team, but, but still, it's really, really cool. And they're an amazing source of inspiration 
constant. They are my first reader. I try everything I write and draw, I try it on them and see how it goes. Uh, I love to create with them too. I mean, my youngest is five. And I think it's that age is absolutely amazing. They can, they don't yet have this anxiety of not making things exactly uh, like the reality. And they're, they're like skilled enough to use like a lot kind of different pencils and brushes and things. And uh, I'm very, very impressed by what my five-year-old is doing. And the three of them, when they were like five, six, it's incredible. So we're doing a lot of art together, baking, living. So yeah, when I'm not drawing, I'm a mom. <laughs> Okay, so um, we are close to the end of our panel, so I'm going to do some book-related questions for us to wrap up with. And the first one is about your your own most recent book. Um, can you can you tell the people watching this panel three things that they should know about the book that you have just created? Um, Tyler, let's start with you. Uh. Oh, I'm trying to think of three things. So my book is Dancing at the Pity Party, and it's um, it's like a colorful graphic memoir about my mom dying. She died um, when I was 19. It was during my spring break, um, my second year of college. But my big thing with my book is that I didn't want it to be 100% sad. I think a lot of death media is just only focusing on the misery of death and their death is such a complicated thing there's so many other emotions there's like awkwardness and anger and silliness like we laughed a lot so um my book is good if you lost someone it's good if uh you know someone who lost someone um because it is an awkward thing to talk to other people about. So hopefully I'm giving people like the secret uh, view into what it's like. Um, and it's very pink. I don't know why every review mentions how much pink is in my book. That wasn't a big thing I was focusing <laughs> on when I made it, but yeah, I guess those are three things. Uh, Victoria, what about you? Three things. Well, it's a true story. I mean, we called it fiction because we made some things up, but um, Omar lived this life. Omar is the older brother. That's his younger brother, Hassan. So Omar and Hassan were born in Somalia and they fled to a refugee camp in Kenya when Omar was four. So yeah, it's a true story. I guess I would tell readers um, the back has more information and pictures of the real life Omar and Hassan. I've gotten notes from readers saying how cool they think that is. And I guess the third thing I want readers to know is Omar has a, a nonprofit that he runs. It's called Refugee Strong. So if you go to refugeestrong.org, you can learn about the work he does with kids who still live in the refugee camp where he grew up. What about you, Chad? Um, well, Doodleville uh, came out in June. It's set in Chicago. Um, and uh, it's, it's, very personal. It's all about like the magic of creating characters and then of being surprised by them or disappointed by them. Um, and uh, all of my own insecurities about making the book are in the book. Um, uh, it A lot of it takes place in the Art Institute of Chicago, or at least some important scenes. Um, it involves uh, the theft of a baby's hat um, and then eventually a kidnapping. Um, and it involves very goofy, imaginative characters like the magical butterfly boyfriends and Captain Cockatoo. So check out Doodleville. Yay! Vicky, what about you? Um, so City of Secrets, um, it's a dark fantasy in a steampunk world. Um, it focuses on the friendship between our two main characters, which was really important to me to just explore friendship and especially like a best friendship so um 
and it's it's got a really compelling mystery in it. What about you, Sophie? So the witches of Brooklyn. So it is um, the story of this young girl, Afi, who's gonna uh, discover that she's a witch. So it's it mixes like reality and fiction, which I which I really love. Uh, it's about witches, which I really really love too. About friendship, about love, and um, and uh, very fun and uh, boyish and uh, eccentric characters, which I really I mean, which is my thing clearly, and uh, and about Brooklyn to one of my favorite places in the world that I just left. <laughs> when is it coming out? It's coming out like September 1st. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yes. Exciting. Yeah. OK, so last question. Um, recommend another recent graphic novel to us. Like, what, what kids in YA graphic novels have you been reading? And tell us about um, what they are, why everyone should read it. Um, Victoria, why don't you go first? <clears throat> so the ones I pulled off my shelf that blew me away most recently was Stargazing by Jen Wang. I just, I often doubt my own artistic abilities. And when I look at her art, I'm just like, she just draws so well, like her little kids. I so I was really blown away with the art and the story in this one. So five stars, Stargazing, Jen Wang. Okay, Tyler, what about you? This book, I think, could fall in a similar category of mine, which is that it could be for adults or, like, teenagers. Uh, it's called Coyote Dog Girl by Lisa Hanawalt. I'm, like, the biggest fan of Lisa Hanawalt. And this is, um, it's like a um, Western, and it's about a girl cowboy, I guess, um, who is a dog in coyote and it just has like beautiful um like watercolor in it and it has sort of like some dark themes but overall it's like um light and just really beautiful and wonderful to look at chad what about you um, I recently read Snapdragon by Kat Lay, and I was just really impressed by it. Um, I felt like it's, it, it tells the story of um, some unexpected like witchery and magic and family connection and history. And, and I just thought it was very, a little bit dark and a little bit gross, but also exploring all of that. And it was very queer and it was very lively. All the characters just seemed to like bounce off of the page. Um, so I, I highly recommend that graphic novel. Vicky, how about you? Um, so I'm gonna recommend a manga. It's one that I've been reading lately and I just love it for every single reason. The artwork is so beautiful. Um, it's called Witch Hat Atelier. And like the artwork in it is stunning. Like I, I just can stare at pages forever, but not only that, the story is really good and it's very accessible for young people, I think. Like it's about um, an 11 year old girl who goes off to learn how to be a witch. But the story itself is like dark and twisty and you know, th th there's always more than that meets the eye. Sophie, what about you? Oh, there are so many that I would like to recommend, but uh, uh, very recently I read The Golden Age that I hadn't read and came out probably in Europe before the States from uh, Cyril Pedrosa and Roxane uh, Morel. And the art is absolutely blow me away. I mean, it's incredible, really incredible. He's so talented, it's ridiculous. And uh, I, I love the universe. It's kind of um, a middle age fantasy, like uh, uh, adventure, very, very much like, um, I don't know, Game of Thrones, maybe a little bit. I don't know. And um, yeah, I loved it. I loved it. I really recommend it. Hey, okay, well, thank you all so much for coming and talking about graphic novels and your creative process. This was great. 
Um, and thank you to our audience for listening to all of us. You should definitely check out all of these books by these amazing creators. Thank you.